You ready? Hit it. All right. <clears throat> Words About Books is a fortnightly book club podcast where two sort of writers read and discuss books. I'm Nate, the man responsible for today's selection, and join me as always is Ben. Aloha. So, for those of you who have been keeping track, uh, we usually trade off picking books. So, I picked Star Wars, and then Ben picked Poppy War, and I did Bruce Campbell, etc., etc. Uh, this time, things are a little different, though. Uh, you might notice that we reviewed The Fold, and I picked that book. And if you haven't, go back and listen to it. It's great. That's all I'm actually allowed to say about it. Or Ben will get upset with me. But you, yes, yeah, I <laughs> your long ban on talking about the fold or Peter Klein. Exactly. So if you want to hear it, you have to go back and listen to that. But I picked the fold, and I also, I mean, I didn't pick this book, but I'm responsible for it. And the reason for that is we were going to do a graphic novel called Welcome Back that Ben picked. And we kind of gotten some issues while we were reviewing it. And so we put it on the shelf. We might come back to it. We might not. But that's why you've got two Nates in a row. I am so sorry. We usually like to space these out. Uh, and for those who, who missed it, we are reviewing Marked by Sarah Fine today. It's an indie book-ish. And... I gave Ben the option of like six different books for him to pick when we were doing a 2019 retrospective, and this is this is what he, this is what he decided to pick. Uh, do you do you regret this pick at all? No, I don't know. I don't know if our 2019 retrospective is out or if we're even going to release that one, but like. I maintain this was the best of the bunch. <laughs> the, y you're really underselling just what you recommended to me. Where did you get the list of books? Let's talk about that. Well, first of all, if if we don't end up releasing the 2019, I'll at least cut the, the end part off where you picked marked. That way it's available. Okay. Um, and as for where I came up with those books, I have no idea. I... Those have been on my Kindle for years and years and years. I don't know why, but you... I decided that, hey, we could read and review one of those. Did you buy and them? I don't think so. I want to say most of them were from, like, Smashwords, maybe? I feel like I got these for free, but I don't know. I'm kind. I kind of hope that I didn't, but. So I should mention I didn't pay to read this either. I used the Kindle Library program, which fun fact for anybody who uses the Kindle Library program. I don't. I didn't know this, but uh, you can't share it across all your devices. You can only check out the book on one device. And what I like to do for these podcasts is I read the book on a Kindle. I go through and I highlight things and I make some notes as I'm as I'm going and then I bring it up on a on a Kindle PC app and I have all my notes in front of me. And I realized a bit late that I couldn't do that, but you can actually export your notes from a Kindle even if the book isn't on multiple Kindles and it will send you like a little PDF of all your notes and stuff and it's really well formatted and kind of cool. That was the single best thing that came from reading this book. <laughs> But to answer your question, of the choices I was given, no, I don't regret choosing this book. Uh, <laughs> go ahead and play them that part where we picked it. And I read like this was the only book that wasn't like just insanely neckbeardy. Oh, yeah. Oh, God. There was. Uh, it wasn't Shock Diamonds. It was the. It was the first book in that series though we read the description yeah it was like i don't know s skull something or i don't know but it was just like 
Oh, my six foot two frame and my <laughs> big muscly arms and my it's exactly like, you, how real people talk. Yeah, that's exactly how I describe myself. <laughs> Casually in my journal, like, uh, but yeah. So, I, so a hard pass on all those other books. If this one was the cream of that crop, is that what you're saying? Yeah, Seraphine is a standout author. When placed next to, I'll give her this. So I think you said the book is indie-ish. It's not self-published, which right. I, th- I think is what you thought it was initially. Right. It's it's actually published through a real publisher. Yeah, I forget exactly which publisher, but Sarah Fine has worked with a bunch of publishers. I think, um, and some of them, some of her books are actually published in like. Um, you know, the, I think the big four publishing houses, but most of those are her young adult stuff. And if I understand correctly, it was a little bit difficult to research her. There's not tons of solid information about all the things she writes and she writes a lot of things. Um, I think this was her first attempt at doing fiction for grownups ups. I think everything else she's written was specifically targeted at the young adult market. And why do you think that is? Why do I think everything was targeted at the young adult market? Or Yes. Um, I know it was. <laughs> do you think it has anything to do with your day job? <laughs> yeah, so Sarah Fine's day job is a child psychologist. Or she has her degree, or her PhD in child psychology she has a phd i yeah she's dr sarah fine i believe oh wow so yeah okay you can check your snobbery at the door this time no i can't yeah she outranks (laughs) you bud so (laughs) it's a phd i mean oh you you don't want one (laughs) no you want to be dr nate no i wouldn't i wouldn't be getting a phd if i got my doctorate anyway Oh my god, you're such yeah, a... Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Get out of your ivory tower. And, and when you say that she's written a lot of books, I'm pretty sure you said that. I'm not, I'm not going to check, but I'm pretty sure that you said that. Uh, I think it was like 32 books written over eight years. I what don't... Uh, yeah, I don't know exactly when the first date of publication was. I think it was 2008. I think. Again, I I spent probably a solid couple hours trying to find info, but with I these... I 2012 on her website. Okay, maybe it was 2012. Um, I don't have any, any hard data. Either way, she's in, insanely prolific, and I don't think she started writing until well after she had her PhD, because she has mentioned in her own bios that she writes she doesn't have any formal training in writing or literature she started writing as a hobby she has since you know written and published all these books and like i said some of them have gone to the big 4 she seems to have a decent number of fans not all of her books are as widely read as some of the others and it seems like her She's really made the biggest name for herself in the young adult genre, which I don't I don't specifically avoid, but I don't specifically go to. So right. I, I don't know a lot of the big authors in young adult fiction. So may, maybe she's big. I know you can find her books in some bookstores. Um, probably not this one. <laughs> Certainly not in the young adult section. Yeah. I would... I would preface this. I think we did warn people in the uh, preview, and if not, I will warn them in tweets and, and whatever places we can that uh, the podcast will not contain these descriptions. So we're, we're going to try to keep this PG-13, except for the occasional curse word. But this book is very explicit. <laughs> um, there are chapters that are just straight up rated X. Yeah, definitely. It it was uh if this was her jump to adult fiction, she jumped all the way. 
into the deep end of adult <laughs> fiction. This went from like J.K. Rowling to to George R. R. Martin and then some. And and don't forget on her website, uh, her points are that she also has the musical taste of an adolescent boy, and will eat anything that's fried. Glad that glad I can get that into the about the author section of this podcast. Hey, you know what? So far, I'm down with that. If she wants to split a Mott stick and listen to some Linkin Park, I'm down. So, anything more you'd like to add to the About the Author, or should I start on the book itself? Um, no, I think, I think the only thing to keep in mind is I... At some point during this podcast, I am going to revisit the point that this is a young adult author, and this book is sort of her first experiment with writing for an older audience. So just put a pin in that. And that actually made me feel a lot better about this book. First attempt. You're allowed to make mistakes. A lot of them. Constantly. (laughs) Oh. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Let me preface everything by saying I think she's a good writer. Even if I think that this book was just not great. Okay. The end. So let's get to the book. (laughs) Mark stars two main characters, and we view the world every other chapter, it alternates between their eyes. So there's Casey Ferry and Eli Margolis. Is that how you say that? All right. And this is Ferry, F E R R Y going to yes. be important to note. She is a super attractive, badass, rich girl who can take care of herself. Keep that in mind. She also helps fairy lost souls to the afterlife because she's a fairy. Get it? I got it. So, a little, little clever word. Eli, on the other hand, is, and I quote, sex on a stick. He's a super buff, sexy ass kicker. He's a really good guy, good boy. He respects women. He loves his friends and family. He's a working class dude. He... But he's not just a white meat, milk toast baby face. He's got a bad boy streak. He's got a dark past with some secrets to give him an edge. When I wrote that, I felt like I was, uh, I was reading Rick and Morty Interdimensional Cable. Well, first I want to correct you and say that Eli doesn't have any friends. I don't know where you got that. He's a friendly dude. He talks to literally no one except Casey and his sister. He talks to also Trevor and Deck and... His boss, his co-worker. Yeah, there you go. (laughs) All right, so Eli is a loner loser who hangs out only with his sister, but also he has a dark past. I would describe him as brooding. God, that is very accurate. Okay, so, Ben, am I supposed to like these characters and empathize with them, or am I supposed to self-insert myself into them? And, if it's a self-insert, is that a sexual or non-sexual insertion? (laughs) <laughs> well, I do understand how you would have a hard time relating to a six foot five fighting badass, very attractive gentleman. <laughs> um, that is going to be your exactly. first hurdle. Uh, no, I, look, he's too good looking. It's not fair. Yes, he's got sandy blonde hair. Oh, he's got the, them tight jeans. But yeah, uh, to answer your question, you are definitely supposed to like them. That they're supposed to be relatable. Um, Interesting. You you haven't really uh, given them. They get a little bit more introduction than this. Like, I don't know if you're going to go into it later, but Eli's life is somewhat complicated by his status in this society and. He's kind of just trying to keep his head down, stay out of trouble. He's very recently uh, come into some some good luck. His sister got a job in a better place, and they're moving up in the world a little bit, and he's just sort of trying not to to rock the boat. 
Whereas Casey's on the opposite end of that spectrum. She's rich. She's been rich her entire life. She comes from one of the most powerful families in the world. She's practically royalty. And she, you're supposed to like her because she makes an effort to be down to earth. You're supposed to like him because he's kind of, despite being sexy Navy SEAL guy, he's also like pretty down to earth, relatable, just Joe every man trying to make his way in the world. And um, I'll be honest with you, I don't read um, a lot of romance novels. I know you may find that shocking. I am pretty shocked. Uh, all of my You're poetry. You're a romantic man. Yeah. I, yeah, I certainly am. Got a sensitive soul. And a spicy scent. Oh, God. Uh, so... I'm going to guess, though, that in a lot of romance novels that the love at first sight thing is a pretty common conceit. And I'd say that is dialed up to 11 in this book. Yeah, they they don't normally (laughs) uh, also stare at each other's naked breasts, but, you know. I, I don't know. I'll let you handle that. But so in this, not only do they fall in love literally at first sight. As soon as they lay eyes on each other, they experience like a uh, instantaneous connection that is both deeply sexual and the truest of true love. A mindgasm. Uh huh. And so my main issue <laughs> is that they. It's not that I don't like either of them individually, it's that I don't quite empathize with their relationship. I'm not. I'm not invested in their relationship. I don't know if they're going to be a good couple. I don't know if they're going to make it or not. So the book kind of does a... A sloppy job. ...of making me want them to get together. But as individuals, I think they're both fine. We've certainly followed main characters that I found to be far more obnoxious or gross. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm okay can't, with this. Can't, I'm not allowed to talk anymore. No, about- you're not. If we're going to compare this to the quintessential young adult romance that everybody knows, Twilight, uh, Casey is definitely more developed than Bella from Twilight, and Eli isn't nearly as creepy as Edward, though he does have some problems in that department. Now, when you say developed, I mean, her. she has a job and interests. She has a... A job. An interest. Okay. Well. Are you going to tell me she doesn't? <laughs> the the book's prologue. <laughs> no. Well, okay. All right. I'll tell you about it later. Okay. It's all, It only really works if we had video. What? <laughs> it's a book. <laughs> oh, are you making faces? <laughs> no, I'm, uh, I'm holding my hands up where breasts would be and say she has a... Oh, job Jesus. and interest. Okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> so the book's prologue. It starts 15 years prior to the story. And Casey and her father, they're in a flooded future Boston. And they go and find her mother's spirit. Her mother just passed away, I think, from cancer or some sort of wasting disease. It sounded like in the hospital. And her spirit is hanging out at the home where she grew up she and her father use a special circular necklace called a scope to enter the world of the spirits called the veil they have a heartfelt goodbye with her mother and they send her to the afterlife which is heaven lucky lucky for her and i actually like the prologue i had some hope for the book after i read this um I don't want to keep bashing on the prologue from other books. So I'm going to move on to Eli. He comes, he comes to the city at the beginning of the book to Boston from the shitty desert hellscape that was Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Now, some, something has happened. Some massive environmental collapse has happened at some point. Because Pittsburgh is described as a desert, and also it sucks just on principle. And Boston is, like, flooded and has canals now. And it's clearly set 
in the future they have like buses that can drive on land and in the water and they've got a lot of interesting new technology so that's the setting that we're in and Eli and his sister his sister just got a research grant but we're not exactly sure what she researches yet and Eli is very protective of her uh she was attacked years prior to the story uh what what would you like to add to this description because i know you want to add something to this well only that i can't imagine what happened to the world like was it some sort of uh, interdimensional shift or something that boston could survive an apocalypse better than pittsburgh because i don't know i mean i guess maybe I, I was was Bill Belichick sitting up in in the box with God and he saw it coming? I don't know, but uh, <laughs> I didn't like that. I didn't, I didn't like the way they treated Pittsburgh. Um, no, I didn't. No, I didn't. That was yeah. That was a, every description of Pittsburgh is just how shit Pittsburgh is. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what her problem is, but it starts off where I was like, okay, Pittsburgh's ruined. That's fine. And then she's like, and then Pittsburgh sucks. And it, oh my god, Pittsburgh is just so awful. And I was like, okay, it smells bad. It's getting a little People hurt. Bad. Getting a little hurtful now. I mean, uh, I'm just saying, uh, Tom Savini, George Romero, Troy Polamalu. Uh, th- these are just people that have nothing to do with Boston. But uh, anyway, uh, yeah, I just want to emphasize that the uh, just just how bad the world is global global warming seems to be the culprit but it seems like there's also a lot of armed conflict the united states is no longer like free travel is not a thing between the united states eli and his sister had to get some sort of visa to come to boston to be granted refugee status as as nate said boston is now some sort of like venice canal city with gondolas transporting people down flooded streets the disaster is to the point that most of the United States, except the coast, is desert. I think they describe Canada as having founded colonies in the Arctic that are now doing quite well, and just pretty much the middle of the world is uninhabitable. Even Boston struggles to get clean water. Uh, running water is rare. Uh, they only run water through pipes a few times a day. Eli and his sister consider that to be the height of luxury. Meanwhile, the the fairies, uh, which are a very large family, you may have thought like when they said the fairy family, they were talking about like a dozen people tops. We're we're talking closer to like fifty thousand people. So they're the they're the one percent of this world and casey is essentially a princess like the fairies it's very unclear what their business is at first but they seem to have enough money that they can just bribe whatever political entities still exist into letting them do whatever they want so that's a big plot point in the story is that Eli uh, is afraid that if he gets into a relationship with Casey and things start to go bad, she has the power to basically just make him not exist or destroy his life for his sister as well. And I'm glad that you put all that in words. I like the setting. I like the setup she did. And then just everything else is constantly hamstrung by this garbage romance plot that just keeps coming up over and over and over again i don't want to get too ahead of myself because the leads haven't met yet but it starts to get really intrusive and i think that you you had the idea of it should be as intrusive in our podcast as it is actually reading the book which i really like that idea would you like me to intrude on the podcast right now yes please do all right i'm going to describe for you the first time casey sees eli (laughs) this man was six and a half feet of chocolatey hotness so eli he gets a job as an emt and he goes and he meets declan fairy which is his boss and Declan welcomes him aboard, 
tells him to go ahead and take a shower before starting his night shift position. And like you said, Eli is like over the moon. Like, oh my God, I can take a shower? And before he goes to do that, he introduces himself to the team as they watch a press conference. And at the press conference are two women and two men. And there's an older looking man who we find is Casey's father. And he's am- announcing that he's stepping down as CEO and giving his position to next in line, which is Rylan Ferry. And, and real quick, uh, what company is he stepping down as CEO from? <laughs> oh, God. Did they say it at this point? I think they said, yeah, they've said it many times. Psycho Pumps Inc. And did you mention what the fairies do? (laughs) (laughs) The fairies fairy people. (laughs) I'm going to explain this real quick because I don't think we actually like delve deep into the lore of it. So they're like Charon in Greek, Greek mythology. Is it Charon or Charon? I like Charon. So let's go with Charon. I don't. So, either way, they're like the fairy men from Greek mythology. Only there's a lot of them, and uh, they have these necklaces they wear that are amulet shaped. They're they're fairly large, and the necklaces can be stretched into a big hoop, and you can lower the hoop over your Charon. Charon. The Greek god is like Charon, and Pluto's moon is like Charon. That's why I was confused. Uh, I like my I like my pronunciation better, but fine, we'll play it your way. So they could pull the amulet into a big hoop, and they could lower the amulet over their head, and use it as kind of a portal to enter the veil. And the veil is, uh, think like the astral plane from D anD. d It's it's a limbo realm in between this life and the next. And whenever somebody dies. They enter this realm and they wait for a fairy to come and usher them to their ultimate destination, which could be either heaven or hell. The fairies, when they find somebody in the veil, um, once they enter the veil, they can um, use their amulet to sort of teleport to any point on the planet within the veil. And then they can bring themselves back out. So they have this um, sort of instantaneous transportation power. They find the person they are supposed to ferry. And they rub their thumb over the amulet and hold it in front of the person. And then that will tell them where the person's going to go. And you want to, you want that preview because sometimes when a person finds out they're going to hell, they run the fuck away and that could be a problem. So you kind of want to, you kind of want to do all the heavens first and, you know, really get their hopes up and then uh, spring that hell on them right quick. (laughs) So... I'm not kidding. This is her strategy. She talks about it. What happens if they run away? That could be a big problem because if they run away and then you can't find them, uh, they start to become like these insane decaying spirits and they start to look in the veil like zombies. And if they can steal a fairy's necklace, which they try to do, they can open up a portal and come back into the world as zombies and that's where zombie stories come from. So Casey all and right. all the other fairies have this. They all wear this giant conspicuous amulet at all times held loosely on their neck by a thin chain. All right. Yeah, you I, I, I think I was going to go into that when uh, when she meets some some spirits. But yeah, that's exactly how fairying for fairies is is done. Go, going back to the meeting, Casey's father gives up the CEO and gives up being Charon to Rylan, his son. And while they're watching this, keep in mind, this is with all the other EMTs. They're watching this when a man named Len comes to introduce himself to Eli. And I'm paraphrasing, but he says something along the lines of, Hey, Eli, nice to meet you. I'm Len, your night ship commanding officer. I'm an evil mustache twirling piece of shit slime ball. I just want to fuck the shit out of that woman on the screen. Possibly while she's too inebriated to do anything about it. She's also our boss's sister and my subordinate. Did I mention that I suck? You know, that is, um... Now, I can't do the voice of that lazy douche from, uh, Futurama. No, I was was gonna say, (laughs) that's actually far more polite 
than what he actually said, which was horrible. And I have never heard anyone talk like that in real life. I'm sure it has happened, but goddamn. Certainly not around other people who supposedly like and respect and are very protective of Casey. Like, they they say that a lot, that these people, they're really protective of Casey. It's like, then why haven't you taken this guy out back and beat the shit out of him? Yeah, there's a, there's a really weird dynamic. So Declan Ferry is the chief of the EMT station. Casey Ferry works at the EMT station. They're both also super rich. They don't need to do this. They're just passionate about it for some reason. And their father has been just donating buckets and buckets of money to keep the EMT stations alive. And as a result of their father's donations, the EMT crews are just insanely loyal to the Ferry family. Except, as you mentioned, when it comes to some guy threatening sexual violence against their, you know, favorite daughter. Yeah, that's the only time when they can turn a blind eye. No big deal. I don't see what's wrong with that. It's they, they she's trying to set up this kind of like Casey's uh Casey's one of the boys like she she earned her right to be in this in this club but what it really comes off like is that Casey thinks she's earned her way into the boys club but they all secretly don't give a shit if she's there or not. I think they like her dad's money. But I don't Jeez, that's brutal and no. Very I th- true. I think that's exactly, like, I don't know if that's purposely what's happening, but Casey I don't think thinks... it was on purpose. <laughs> I don't think that was on purpose at all. Casey thinks these guys like her, but they don't. Yeah, that, that, that's pretty accurate. Now, Eli. Eli is a good person, okay? He would never think of doing what Len is doing right now, but uh, he is kind of undressing her with his mind, and hoping that maybe he'll get to see her, and I wonder if she dates people other than executives and playbook. I wonder... I wonder if she's wearing any underwear. Ooh, oh my god, she's gonna be my new partner? Oh my god, I... Yeah, I can't wait to accidentally walk in the shower and stare at her chest uncomfortably long. But yeah, Len's, Len's the asshole. Len, Len's, the, uh, Len's the jerk here. Oh okay. yeah. Yes, he is, actually. <laughs> he is. He's not the only one. <laughs> Look, uh, okay. I'm not going to... Def- I'm not going to say that Eli is as bad as Lynn, because yeah. Lynn has no redeeming qualities whatsoever. He's just a piece of shit human being. Okay. Eli... Th- th- again, this is my love at first sight problem. Eli is either just exceptionally horny, or... He's never seen a woman before. I don't know. <laughs> like <laughs> that's possibly it. I, his his attraction to her is described. He's definitely sexually attracted to her. He's definitely too sexually attracted to her. Like thirsty. She's, yeah, that dude. Thirsty. I ain't a thirst. Thirsty as fuck. But it's a more innocent attraction. Like he wants to date her. He's not talking about like. Well, he was wondering about her panties. Which, you know, as long as you keep that in your head. (laughs) (laughs) It's still weird. It's still weird. I I will give it a pass that he didn't. It's not a crime. (laughs) Yeah, he didn't join in on Len's. uh, I'd also (laughs) like to just get her loaded up on liquor and go to town. Yeah, it's like Len is planning a crime. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Yes. And, And Eli is just way too horny. And that's the problem that we find a lot in this book, that the characters, they don't come off as adult. They come off as really horny teenagers. Yeah, it's it's bad. I mean, they both do. Casey, we'll see, objectifies or sexualizes Eli in the same way. She's also very thirsty. Uh, Did I just teach you this word when you read the script? No, but I, I don't use it regularly, and so I need to get it out of my system here. Good. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So Sarah Fine, she writes. She writes a lot of young adult stuff, and then she's, uh, I guess, a child psychologist. I don't know if she spends a lot of time in the headspace of a teenager. Uh, it, it seems that way to me. Like there, there is certainly a type of guy who like is just looking at. 
I don't know, uh, Scarlett Johansson or something. And she's like, oh, my God. Oh, I wonder if she's wearing this or that or blah, blah, blah. And it's like, nobody likes that guy. Nobody certainly wants to be that guy. Uh, I, you should be able to see beautiful women and not, like, go into crazy, weird sex fantasies about them. If you see somebody that's particularly attractive, I guess Eli can't can't help that he finds her particularly attractive, but... It's just an unbelievably over the top reaction that I could see like a a fourteen or fifteen year old boy who's just realizing girls exist having, but I can't see like an adult man who's supposedly had many adult relationships and has been with a woman before and also is like a refugee with problems, just like yeah. I, I think she wanted to write an adult romance, but she only did young adult before, and so she she overcompensated, and so she tried to make it more adult by adding more, like, sexual stuff, and it, it just comes off as more juvenile, though. What she did was Eli and Casey's relationship is, like, a teen relationship, but instead of going to school, they have jobs, and instead of kissing, they have sex. And she just kind of took two teenagers, aged them up, and didn't give them any of the maturity or responsibility or, I don't know, distractions of adulthood. Like, I don't know. Maybe it's because I'm an elderly man now. No, that's pretty accurate. I've Although got, I'm also an elderly man. It's so. like, I got bills. Like, if I was a refugee, I just got to this city. I'm meeting people for the first time. And I'm about to, like, have my first shift in a city I don't know that also has <laughs> We'll find out. Um, ah, you ruined it. You ruined the reveal. I know. I took it from you. Cause you're, you're... gonna have to cut that out. <laughs> 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 so after that, we we switch to Casey's perspective, where she learns that her new partner is a gross desert dweller from Pittsburgh. It's getting hurtful. It stated that her previous partner died, and she had to escort him to hell. Probably dodged a bullet there. <laughs> yeah. Don't know what he was up to. <laughs> she meets up with Trevor, who's only kind of important in the story. Very, very minor character, but this is when we get first introduced to is it the Kiri? It's like curry, but not uh K E R E. I don't I think speak we... Greek. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna go with Kiri then. I guess it's Kiri, yeah, or Kier. So so the Kiri they mark people who are fated to die, and then they get to choose the cause of death. And they get all their le- their uh, assignments from Moros, who is their leader. And the Kiri are humans who gave up their souls in exchange for immortality, superpowers, and the life of luxury. And in the Vale, they have sharp claws and teeth, and they have red eyes, both in the Vale and in the real world when they get, like, emotional. They're not or angry vampires. Just, no, no, of they're, course not. They're not, vampires don't have yeah, claws. Yeah, vampires are like so played out in and romance and stuff. We're not doing vampires. We're doing Kiri or Kier. I. This is going to be a big problem for the podcast. Well, you can't mix. You can't mix vampires with uh, Charon. Yeah. So I'm going to just say this now because this bothers me too. All the mythology in this is Greek, and all the people are painfully Irish. Well, I... <laughs> as we know, the Irish don't have a mythology of any kind, right? Yeah. Well, it's set in Boston, so I guess they all, they all have Irish names, and but they're, they're Greek Shinigami, and Charon <laughs> is a title that's passed from father to son. Some, I don't know. Oh, I didn't like that. Well, here's something you might like. Casey's showering off when Eli walks in on her and just stares at her breast. But don't worry, because Casey thinks that Eli is sex on a stick. Oh, yeah. Were you as hot and bothered at this point as I was? I have many comments in my <laughs> notes about... <laughs> I have a lot of notes this was the chapter where i wrote this is gonna be a long book there are lots of uh <laughs> thrown wrote, in there as well is that how that works 
like refer like I had to go ask people about human anatomy so many times during this book. And I feel like based on the responses I got, um maybe Sarah Fine should have been the one asking about human anatomy. To say it's cringy is an understatement. I physically literally cringed. Oh yeah. There were times where I just had to put the book down. Yeah. I, I actually I face palmed like unironically. It was bad. Uh, no, was... I had visceral reactions to how yes. just embarrassing the dialogue is in this book. Do you, do you ever get that that embarrassment where it's like, yeah, you're the only one reading it, but like you feel like other people might know you read it, and you just like feel bad, like gross. Uh, yeah, I do because uh, like I track the books I read. <laughs> I had to write this down. <laughs> and I had to make sure yeah. everybody who could possibly see that record knew it was your fault. <laughs> yep. So actually that's a good that's a good segue because a lot of reviews I saw in Goodreads talk about how unnecessary the romance is, how much there is of it, how cringy it is, and they seem to have the idea that this is an, an urban fantasy or possibly a mystery book first and a romance second which is what i thought but i'm an idiot because this book is definitely a romance book first and an urban fantasy second and you apparently knew that going Uh, in the book is described i I think it's it places itself firmly in the romance category It, it it intends to be romance the only thing i would say is it's not necessarily you use the word romance and you mean sex because well, it's trying to be wrong. Yeah, that's the problem. It's not that I never get invested in the relationship between the two characters because their relationship is so purely superficial. It's not until are you are you telling me that you do not watch porn for the plot? I'm not <laughs> comfortable <laughs> having not. this conversation with you. Um. I was going to say, look, if you want to, if you want to write erotica, like if you want to write really graphic books about sex, I'm not even going to say that's wrong. There's a place for that. There's a market for that. It could be a healthy way to express yourself. That's fine. If you want to write romance, like romance and pornography appeal to very different parts of, of the human psyche. And what I've seen is that probably a lot of people wouldn't have minded Casey and Eli growing increasingly close and having a love story and, you know, maybe even having sex scenes. But just the graphic descriptions of of pervy, horny stuff is intrusive into the book and your ability to enjoy the book is largely dependent on your ability to ignore that nipples oh god we're gonna have to bleep that (laughs) she graphically describes every body part she graphically describes what everybody wants to do to each other it's just and it just keeps coming up it's not like they're constantly having sex throughout the book but it's they're constantly thinking about it and their thoughts are very pervy and gross i don't know it it's this romance book needed more romance and it needed a lot less sexualization like romeo and juliet doesn't have a sex scene that is kind of my point i guess so do you feel like that this was supposed to cater to the romance audience and it just took a swing and a miss yeah i do because casey and eli it it doesn't really even start to come together until the end but their feelings for each other do go beyond purely physical they're they're monogamous they're they respect each other's boundaries things like that like it's not overtly like kinky or anything like that it's just i think she she's like what's the difference between young adult romance and adult romance oh it's the sex and i think that was the swing and the miss that may well be a part of the difference. That may be a difference between a younger romance and a, and a more mature romance, but that is not the only difference. Like a lot of a lot of teen couples don't sit around and talk about how they're going to pay for their bills, or you know, are we going to start a family, or things like that. There's there's more mature 
partnership and bonding that goes on beyond just sex and she didn't she didn't get any of that the reason i asked is because it took me a long time to figure out who the hell this book was supposed to be for um and i and that answers it that's i think that i think that you're right um i think it just swing and a miss yeah it was an experiment and it failed in some places uh i wouldn't have published it not in this <laughs> we talk about this a lot on this podcast just one more draft would really help and i know eventually you got to push it out and and be done with it especially when you write as many books as she does but i really do think i wouldn't have like i don't think she should like be ashamed of having written this or anything like that but i i think it this definitely needed a little more time to cook before releasing it it has it has a lot of potential to be a really good story and i think it just suffered from being released a little too early. Well, let's move on to the plot. Casey, she starts giving Eli mixed messages by playing the game of I like you, no I don't, yes I do, no I don't. She's a child. She shares Mocklet with Eli that scumbag Len gave to her in an attempt to get her to fuck him. Which, whatever. <laughs> um, <laughs> real, you're, you're giving... You're giving a trillionaire princess, like, fake chocolate as an attempt to woo her. Can I just say, can we just call it, can we just call it chocolate, for Christ's sake? No, it's mocklet. That was the dumbest world building thing. (laughs) Like, Like, oh, the world is so broken, we don't have chocolate anymore, we just have mocklet. Uh, Casey and and Eli, they only eat one piece of mocklet. And then they throw it in the garbage right in front of Len. Casey immediately regrets it because she wants Eli to just rub Mocklet all over her body. Uh, she she sure does. Now I like the next part. Okay. So they <laughs> so they go to they go to rescue people. Yeah. See see how it's intrusive. Pink nipples. They go out to rescue people. Uh. <laughs> their ambulance is an amphibious vehicle like like the bus was so it goes on land goes in water cool uh, some asshole in a motor vehicle wasn't paying attention blew through an intersection took out a non-motorized boat just full of people and then i get to see their really cool medical supplies like automatic resuscitators the just oxygen masks without the tanks uh they had self-perpetuating sailing now first of all cool second of all they have to have trank guns because their job is very hazardous boston you know it's better than crappy pittsburgh but it's still kind of a you know it's it's kind of run down (laughs) so so uh they need trank gun uh in case they they get to the field and uh they're can, hostiles. Can I just stop the you police... there? Can, can I just stop you there? Are you oh, telling sure. me you would rather eat a bowl of clam chowder <laughs> than a Permani Brothers sandwich? <laughs> no, I just like uh, I just like pushing your butt. I'm I'm sorry. Like <laughs> we'll, we'll see. I, I don't know if this keeps coming up. I don't know if I'm going to be able to enjoy this book. Well, uh, we'll we'll try to we'll try and keep this civil. So so police officers basically, I guess. There's so many accidents now, they just don't even bother. Like, they don't show up to the scenes of uh, accidents. So that's why the EMTs have to have trank guns. Anyway, they they arrive at the scene. They realize that there isn't enough room for everybody. So Casey cheats, and she looks at who is marked for death and who isn't. So she prioritizes the people who are not marked for death. And then one of the greatest things ever happens. Even though you ruined it, I'm definitely just going to roll with it. It's Canal Pirates. I laughed, I laughed, I continued laughing. I thought that was so goddamn funny, just the, everything about it, the name, the concept. It, I wish that there were more of them in this book. I wish that this were just a book about battling Canal Pirates. I would have loved this book so much more if that were the case. Canal Pirates, they like to show up at the scenes of accidents. Uh, apparently they're patched into the the emergency response system somehow. The, that never gets brought up again, and unfortunately neither do canal pirates. So 
The pirates come in. They're going to loot the scene. They're going to take organs, and they're going to attack the EMTs who are on the scene. Casey gets shot with a harpoon, but she's wearing armor, so it only phases her, and she sedates the, the assailant. And then she she turns to to warn Eli. Eli, they're, they're canal pirate, but she doesn't get the chance to warn him because he is just casually beating the shit out of, like, four dudes while, while also saving a patient. Look, I'm going to forgive you for not knowing this, but... Literally everyone from Western Pennsylvania has mad kung fu skills, so you know that that part totally made sense. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I know you. you, just, you and yeah, you you just don't understand our culture. The phrase, quote, like he punched canal pirates all the time. He very well may. Out. Pittsburgh's three noble rivers have long been home to pirates. <laughs> it was so great. I laughed out loud again. This is probably my favorite chapter in the entire book, and the plot hasn't even really started yet. Uh, Casey is taken out from behind by their leader, and let's keep track of this statistic. Casey is 0 and 1. That mind though, she's a badass. Is she a badass? Like, wh- where she was she hunts that? down spirits and sends them to hell? Yeah, but they don't have bodies. I mean, that doesn't mean she's good at fighting. Well, later in the in the book, it, it's shown that it doesn't matter if they have bodies; they can still beat your ass and rot, which is weird. Yeah. A little strange, you're right. And come back to the real world with bodies again, which is weird. So, and what happens when you kill them as a zombie? Do they get another spirit, or well, do, they just gone you, from existence? Can you kill them? I don't know. I don't think anyone ever does. I don't, I don't think that happens. What do you do? Just throw them to the bottom of the ocean, then? No, you gotta fairy ring them. Not like an actual fairy ring, but like with the rings that these F-E-R-R-Ys have. Well, don't don't worry, though. I know you were worried that Casey might be dragged away to have her organs harvested by these canal pirates. But Eli comes to the rescue and beats the fuck out of the leader. And then he gingerly, gingerly lifts her up and into the ambulance with the other people that they're rescuing. And they save a bunch of people and they get out of there before reinforcements from the canal pirates pirate brigade show up and the day is saved but len is pissed off at eli if you ever if you ever touch her the way you just did ever again i will have you transferred so fast your head will spin like you know like how he touched her to save her life and get her out of danger from being dissected by canal pirates len's len sucks well, it's we, just a but, fucking piece of shit. I have I've had this question since I first encountered Len. Does Len have the power to get people transferred? No, because he later asks Deck to do it. So he doesn't have the power. He can just recommend it. I guess. I mean, God, like what a. So basically, his threat is: if you ever try to save her life again. I swear to God, I will recommend to her brother that she that he transfers you somewhere else. And then I got to imagine, like, okay, so th- this was the thing that boggled my mind about Len for the whole book. Len is afraid Eli is going to successfully hook up with Casey. And if he successfully hooks up with Casey, Len is not going to have any of that. He's going to transfer Eli. He's going to go straight to Casey's brother and he's going to say, transfer Eli. And then Casey's going to go straight to Casey's brother and say, fire Len. <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, well, that, that brings us to another problem that we were discussing. How does Len have a job now? I feel like he should not have been around this long. No, there's definitely no... HR department at this EMT station because Len is like, they don't even have sexual harassment trainings for Len's behavior because it's just kind of obvious that you don't do that. (laughs) True. Yeah, Len, uh, I don't remember where I plan to say this, but yeah, at some point Len is a, Len is a trope that I hate and it's not just this book that's guilty of it, but there's there's sometimes when the stakes are not quite high enough for the drama that the book would like to go for 
they have a character who is simultaneously unbelievably evil or annoying and also unbelievably immune from consequence for their behavior. It's like the, uh, the Draco Malfoy, except without the satisfaction of Hermione eventually punching him in the face. Um, it's, it's that character who's just like always seems to get away with uh, screwing over the, the more honest, more noble main character. But with Len, it's like Eli is afraid of all these things like deportation and being transferred from his job and all the, all these like very practical concerns. Whereas Len is just like, oh yeah, I'm going to rip that Jesus. Len, you said that at work in front of a room full of people. <laughs> yeah. I, I literally about, have about your subordinate. I literally yeah. have to fire you now. Like I yeah. God. Also, let let's throw a little more fuel on this fire. He he tells Eli to get his shit together, keep his eyes open out there, because Casey can't lose another partner. Cause her last partner was dragged away by canal pirates. They ripped out his organs, and that traumatized her? Like, she was the victim of those canal pirates. I mean, but... that would be traumatizing. I don't, I'm not sure what you're... Well, who, who's, who's the victim here? Len? The guy who lost his liver and his fucking kidneys. Well, yeah, but his problems are over. I mean, he's in hell now, <laughs> yeah, so not really. His problems but... are over. Okay, <laughs> fine. <laughs> you win. <laughs> Casey's the one who's got to live with it. <laughs> Except we also find out that she had to send him to hell personally. So that was... <laughs> Which, again, I feel like would be kind of traumatizing. Uh, well, he kind of dodged a bullet, like you said. Yeah, I mean, if he was going to hell, I'd have been like, I'd, I'd have been like, oh my god, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And then I'd have, I'd have rubbed my thumb across that amulet and been like, um, what Something did you, you do? There's some people, like, uh, we don't see a lot of the divine judgment here, but uh, it seems like you gotta do something pretty bad. <laughs> well, let, let's let's talk about that, because the next scene, she goes to ferry people into the afterlife using her magical coin. And magical all amulet. the magical coin amulet. Well, yeah, if you're gonna start using coin for the amulet, this is gonna get very confusing. <laughs> <laughs> so she uses her magical MacGuffin. It's not a MacGuffin. Her magical blueberry. She goes in there. What? And <laughs> she she ferries. She does exactly what you said. Tell you what, I bet All those amulets these... are made of Pittsburgh steel. Does Does Pittsburgh still make steel? No, but I think U.S. Steel still has their headquarters there. Uh, I did check though. Uh, in the city was listed among the 10 best places to retire in the U.S. in 2012 by CBS Money Watch. <laughs> and, oh, th here's a relevant one. Uh, in February 2013, Forbes again placed Pittsburgh among its 10 most unexpectedly romantic cities in the world. I didn't see Boston on that list. Might have been on that list. I didn't really read the whole list, but <laughs> we're on there. Okay, well, she uses this, this steel amulet made of Pittsburgh steel. Goddamn right. And she ferries all the Chinese people who were run over by this asshole driver into heaven. And then she pulls a, hey, you're, you're also totally going to heaven. And then she, uh, she sends that guy to hell. Just throws him right in the portal. Or really, she swings the portal over his head and he screams in agony as he is tortured for all eternity and every time you send someone to heaven or hell you get a you get a fun token you get a gold token uh a gold coin i guess i should stop being silly they get paid to send people off to the afterlife and then the kiri who marks the people they show up in this case it's trevor and they split the coin by having the kiri bite it in half it's, it's split it in half. Yep. And let, let's talk about those a little later so we can move forward with the plot. But Trevor is told that he has a last-minute job. Ooh, how mysterious. And 
Casey returns back to the ambulance bay, a job well done, and then there's another there's another accident and gasp. One of the victims is her father. So the ambulance crews arrive to find her father in bad condition. He's got multiple penetrating bullets in his body. They they strap a blood pressure ring to his his neck. They 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 get him they get him all resuscitated and shit. Eli is there, trying his best. Casey is there being traumatized and not very helpful and I can I can give her a pass for that one. Um Big of and they you. get him. They rush him to the hospital, but Casey knows that father is marked for death. So it doesn't matter. Like, he's fucked anyway. His last living words were to Eli, and the word was Galena. Is that how you say it? Galena? I think it's Galena. Galena. I'd say Galena. Okay. Galena, which is Eli's sister's name. And he and... rationalizes that he must just know another Galena. It's no way it's his sister. Or perhaps he is referring to Galena the geological uh, mineral that is often a ore of lead and sometimes silver that was mined uh, by the Romans who were able to retrieve a surprising amount of silver from it and actually uh, used to construct most of the lead piping in Rome. He might have been talking about that. Eli is not smart enough to know that. But you're right. Mr. Fairy could definitely have been doing... I've been talking God, about that. You don't think about that, but his name really is Mr. Fairy. Mr. Fairy, yep. And Len comes over to blame Eli for Mr. Fairy's death because Eli, he stabilized the guy as best he could. He got him in the hospital. He died in the hospital, and it's Eli's fault that he died in the hospital. So Casey, she immediately suspects foul play because Mr. Fairy... He stepped down as CEO, and then, like, the same day, he gets shot to death. That can't be right. Can we? And did we explain the convoluted uh, immortality powers of fairies? Yes, we, we, we haven't. So, fairies are immortal until they give up their position, and then they're just human. Uh, uh, uh. Until they give up their sexy back tattoo. That's that's correct. All fairies have, for some reason, raven wings tattooed on their Whoa back. Whoa, now. Not for some reason, okay? These sexy raven r- wings, they are there to tell the kir, the kiri, sorry, that's the plural. These raven wings are there to tell the kiri that they are off limits from being marked. Okay, I could be... the I. I'm not an expert on Greek mythology. This is not even one of my areas of interest. But what the hell do ravens have to do with this? Like, are ravens part of, like, the It Karen makes her seem or edgier 80s? and sexier. I will agree that is hot, but, like... <laughs> That's the reason. Look, That's the Greek mythology reason. I cannot be aroused under false pretenses. If the logic doesn't add up, this isn't happening. I need to know why she has a raven wing back tattoo. Well, we're never going to find out. Maybe we have to read the next two books. And have they considered, perhaps, just getting um, people they don't want the cure to mark? Like, he, okay, so he's, he's, not the, he's not the Karen anymore, and he uh, has to give up his back tattoo. Could he just get, like, another back tattoo? <laughs> like anyone can get a raven wing back tattoo it has to be the specific back tattoo though they have thousands of examples tens of thousands of examples someone can copy that he's the richest man in the world he has access to the finest back tattoo artists well it it's it's fine because he was okay with going because he got to go to heaven to be with his second wife, but not presumably his shitty first wife, who we never hear about. So he's oh, okay with... shit. I forgot he was married twice. Yes. You <laughs> see, there are four children of this man. There's Casey and Deck, who are the products of the second marriage, and Rylan, who is the new Charon, and Casey's sister, Aslan? Ashlyn. Ashlyn is her half-sister, the product of the first marriage, and they don't really talk about their mother, so she, she must not have been important. 
What if they both went to heaven? Threesome. Uh, Sounds like heaven to me. <laughs> sounds complicated and hot. Maybe they, maybe Sarah Fine should have written a book about that. Maybe she will. So the four siblings, they meet up and they find their dad's spirit. And like I said, he gets to go have a threesome in heaven. But what's interesting is he's not at his childhood home or in his mansion or his office or whatever or or at his his wife's old house he's yeah. like could i say something here because this is just sure this is like a another bad faith complaint but i, I just want to point this out like if it's an important character who dies their spirit finds its way to some relevant place to their past and if it's just one of the people casey's fairy and is part of her job they just <laughs> they're just wherever they died yeah yeah the 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 Chinese people and the guy who hit their vehicle, their special important place was the intersection where their yeah. where their vehicles collided and killed them. No, it it could be like I don't know because her mom wasn't a fairy though. Like her mom didn't have any special powers. No, her her mom was just a regular human. Yeah, so it's it's only important people who get. <laughs> like a whole scene for their death. Everybody else just stands in a line and waits for her to do it. But yeah, her her dad gets to be outside of uh fuck, where is he? He's outside Eli's of Eli's apartment, right? Yeah, Eli's apartment. She doesn't know it's, it's Eli's apartment, but Yes. At, at first I called bullshit, but there's actually a reason for it, so I was like, okay, fine. Good whatever. I actually so... I, I wanna okay. The worst part about this book is the intrusive sex stuff. The Yes. Anything put under a microscope, you're going to find little things you can knock. That's like the whole point of that stupid Cinema Sins channel. And we do that and we have fun with it. Like, I have to say, I raised a bunch of questions as I was going through the book. Like, I thought I was going to have all these problems that I could point out and it would be super funny. And I was surprised just how many of them she wound up, like, addressing. So, with this being a trilogy, like, I She's got a surprisingly consistent story. Yeah, it's not bad. Other than the weird intrusive shit. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that so came out dad, harsher than you meant. I think. <laughs> yeah, I, it it did. It did. Okay, let, let let's go back to her dad real quick because he does say that protecting the future is more important than righting the wrongs of the past. It's weird and then, because those are often one and the same. And then and then off he goes to heaven. And a gold coin comes out, and no cure arrives to claim the coin, which seems to strongly imply that this marking was not authorized, and and the dad was not fated to die tonight. Rylan and Ashlyn, they leave to go deal with whatever, and Rylan promises that he will meet with Moros to figure out what the hell is going on. And for whatever reason, Casey fears that if Rylan can't put on a show of strength to Moros, then, quote, it could be open season on fairies. Open season on fairies doesn't really make any sense because the the two sides can't go to war because the the third side, the third party, the keepers, they, they have power over both of them. Whatever. Yeah, I, well, Whatever. so I'm super unclear on... Uh, now, this is obviously going to be something that they deal with more in the sequels, but I have no idea who the Keepers are or what their powers are. Yeah, I, that's definitely safe for the sequel, which we will not be reading. No. So, that's a, that's unfortunate. That Unless you tell us in the comments. Yeah, let, let's do that. If you, if you want my complete mathematical analysis of the entire, what is it, Marked Trilogy? Servants of Fate Trilogy. Uh, let me know problem i have with this is that they're hinting at like a war between supernatural entities and the destruction of reality but they they gotta they gotta focus on casey's naked body so uh let's kind of put all those stakes and conflict get that out of here we need we need eli's erection in the book okay Okay. It bothered me. It bothered me <laughs> so much. So you don't think there should be a romance in this book? I think that when you have reality ending stakes, the romance should be the B plot, 
not the A plot. That's my problem. Because who the fuck cares about your romance if reality ceases to exist, idiot? Well, I mean, without romance, why even live in reality? Get laid, get paid, power aid. What the hell are you talking about? (laughs) I was going to say, though, going along with your point, um, because there are world-ending stakes, and because the plot takes itself pretty seriously, I assumed for a long time, actually, that the mysterious connection between um, Casey and Eli was actually mysterious. And they keep mentioning Eli has all these weird exceptions to like normal mortal rules like oh yeah that's coming up yeah so i won't get too into it but i i really thought they were going somewhere with like eli was central to the plot and he's more plot adjacent he it's not that he has nothing to do with this world ending plot but they could have easily fixed that by making eli just a little bit more connected to events so Okay, so Casey and Deck, they're just hanging out, fucking around, faffing about, whatever you want to say. I wouldn't say that. In the veil, where their father was sent to the afterlife, just discussing things, just taking their sweet-ass time, not really doing anything, when they're attacked by shades. And shades, as we probably mentioned, they're spirits that didn't pass on, or they lingered in the afterlife. Or I guess this limbo. They're in the veil. They didn't actually go to heaven or hell. And their goal is to attack a fairy, get a scope, and escape into the real world and become a zombie. Yeah, from there, who the hell knows? But the important thing is the shades attack Casey and Deck. And they the two attempt to fight back, but Casey fails to do any meaningful damage, gets her throat torn open... And my note here was, she sucks. She's now at 0 and 2 for fights. Have so you the, have you talked about how she dropped her scope earlier? I was about to. Okay, okay. so the shade reaches for her scope, but it's not there. Because Casey dropped it earlier by where her dad died. Which kind of seems like a... Kind of seems like a big problem to have these giant medallions hanging around your neck that you can easily drop at any time. But whatever. So all the shades decide to gang up on Dex. They successfully get his scope. And Dex runs runs off to go get it. And just leaves her there. Because I guess there's, there's really nothing he can do. She's going to die if he can't get her back into the real world. So meanwhile... Eli goes back to the scene of Patrick's fairy fairy's death because the plot needed him to do that. And he found her scope, he brought it home, accidentally opens it, which he's not supposed to be able to do, steps inside of it, and hey, it turns out Casey was attacked right outside of his apartment. That's that's uh that's neat. So he brings her back out of the veil but not before they see red eyes peering at them from outside. So here's here's this tense scene, okay? Eli is super concerned. Casey is bleeding to death. She's got a hole where her throat should be. Her uniform is sticky from all the blood. And oh my God, she's not wearing a bra. Oh, wow. Here's a quote. Uh, Casey had sent him from emergency triage mode to raging erection in two minutes flat. Has Seraphine ever met, like, real people or been in the medical field for real? Or... That's That that never happened. That's not how that works. Uh, what's, your, what's your take on that? That uh, Seraphine <clears throat> learned everything she knows about human intimacy from Japanese porn comics. Yeah, that's, that's pretty I... accurate. I also highlighted uh, her torso was streaked with blood and there were smudges of it on her cheeks, but she was still the loveliest thing he'd ever seen. Her skin was warm and temptingly smooth beneath his hands. She's dying. Like, he's talking about her like he's a fucking necrophile serial killer. Like, this is probably how Jeffrey Dahmer talked about people. It's really weird. 
It's really weird. And this is like, this is exactly what I was talking about when I said uh, about the difference between like romance and sex. He should be afraid of losing her as a person. He should be doing everything he can, like panicking, trying to control his shaking hands as he tries to stabilize like this woman he's in love with. But he's ogling. He doesn't know she's got regenerative powers. He thinks she's dying. And he's like horny. It's so weird. Uh, it's it's serial it's killer gross. stuff. It's, yeah, it's it's creepy and weird and gross. It would not be out of place in a horror book. Like it is really weird. This was like total. Like you talk about swing and a miss. This was a total swing and a miss. I have no idea what the hell she was thinking. Yeah, uh, surgeons like when they do open heart surgery, they're not like oh she's she's got a nice rack. No. They're like, okay, we gotta split open this fucking chest cavity <laughs> and and do surgery on her heart. It's like it's it's not a it's not a very sexy setting. It's basically a slab that you have to a slab of meat that you have to fix. But if you're writing a romance, this was the time to do something romantic, and instead she brought it back to just purely sex. And when yeah. you when you mix, uh, I'm going to say this, when you mix sex and violence, horror, that is a recipe for a serial killer. Absolutely. And that is exactly what was done here, and it's fucking weird. I, and, like, I don't well, think she's weird. I just think this was, like, like you said, it's a swing and a miss. She knew that Casey was basically okay. Like, this is, like, the difference between, like, your, you know, somebody, like, cutting their fingy in the kitchen and hacking off a limb in the kitchen. There's a time to be cute and there's a time to be like deadly serious. It makes Eli look like a serial killer, which is obviously not what she was going for. So Casey wakes up in one of Eli's t-shirts because he is the nicest person ever. She's confused that she could see Eli in the veil last night because Normally, humans are supposed to be almost invisible in there. She gets a call from Deck, and they discuss what happened, and everything's fine. And uh, she she tells him that, you know, she doesn't say what happened with Eli, but she does say that she gets out of there, right? She doesn't implicate him. She, she wants to figure out what's going on first. And then Deck tells her that, Shithead Len wants to transfer EY to a unit with the highest casualty rate, which Deck refused. And then, after all that, Casey's like, all right, I'll see you tonight. She's like, I'm going to just try and sneak out of here. It's like really awkward. Like, I'm in EY's apartment. I don't really, I mean, I, he, he's, he's a nice guy, but I've only known him for like two days. And oh my God. Oh, no. he, <laughs> he is... <laughs> Am I gonna have to bleep this? I I couldn't keep it together. She's <laughs> she's oogling his humongous c- while he's sleeping on the couch. <laughs> and, and before that, she's talking about how wholesome he is because he only stripped her top off, but he left her bottoms on. What a gentleman! Oh yeah, the I think I told you that there's like a secret plot here where like Casey's just got a depressingly sad life like the bar she sets for for like good treatment is so low oh the guys at the station love me i mean they joke about doing horrific violent crimes to me but you know boys like that's just normal it's like oh eli doesn't molest his critically wounded patients such chivalry oh i'm it's like i'm kind of sad for her there's yeah there's a point where she's put it that way she's like self-conscious about him seeing her naked for the second time in two days and she goes she goes get a grip she whispered he he probably thought you were bleeding to death he probably wasn't even (laughs) thinking about that and i was like oh boy he sure should have (laughs) right like yeah that that would be the correct response for a human being to have is is to not be thinking about your looks at that point she's a psychologist I, I don't know if you were going to a therapist and you said, I'm a doctor. I've got this problem. I had this really, really hot patient, but she was just covered in blood and like torn, torn ligaments were hanging out of her throat. And, uh, oh, Jesus. yeah, it, it was just the hottest thing I'd ever seen. 
And that therapist would be like, I'm going to make some calls. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Casey, for her part, she's really trying to control her urge to just jump on this sleeping dude and fuck it right there on the couch. Uh, but but then she's interrupted. So many bleeps this episode. Before she can do that, though, his sister shows up and his sister seems to think that they're an item now. Why would she think that? <laughs> and, and that they must have gotten into a fight because he's sleeping on the couch. And Casey lets out a high-pitched giggle like a fucking schoolgirl in response. She then gets jealous that Eli might hook up with other women, thinks he's entirely edible. There is and so much food imagery in this book multiple people refer to multiple things that are not edible as delicious and then after that she tells eli's sister that quote she needs to have some fun and this is again to a person she met like two minutes ago oh boy at this point i was just begging the book to just have them fuck already I was so tired of hearing about this. It was so obvious because you read from both of their perspectives that they both just want to jump on each other and get it over with. And I just wanted them to get their rocks off so we could get back to the world ending or really reality ending story that had been set up. And that's the bigger story of the two. So the book does almost grant my request. Because Eli, after after Eli's sister leaves, Eli is like, "So what's up with that like other world inside your your necklace and like all the like you your your neck is it was torn out and now it's back like what the fuck?" And Casey is like, "Maybe instead of answering his questions, I can just f- him and he'll just forget all about it." Hey, like, hey. It works when you ask me (laughs) for a progress update on Eden. So, but Eli, okay, Eli is a noble man. And despite being a walking, talking erection with legs, he is too noble to get a meaningless like that. He wants it to mean something. It can't just be because she's trying to distract him from whatever. Casey was escorted out of the apartment and she was embarrassed and ashamed. And then we cut to Eli, the next chapter, regretting his decision to not f*** her when she was throwing herself at him. He, he <laughs> the next chapter, he's like, e- I think that Casey's hiding something. <laughs> A big something. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you found another world in her fucking necklace, you jackass. God. Eli may (laughs) not be a secret genius. And it's kind of like how his... We haven't really even talked about Galena, but it's like how Galena got this job because she is a genius. She's working at, like, Harvard researching something. But then it turns out what she's researching is uh, disease. Like, she's researching cures for diseases. And Eli has no idea what she's working on despite <laughs> being like a mini doctor you know he doesn't he doesn't find out until the general public start to find out this becomes a big problem for me eli just loves his sister so much they're just so close they're just so awesome he knows nothing about her he never asks her how her day went is he a white knight no <laughs> <laughs> so where we're at right now is Eli goes to work, and Casey, uh, she realizes that Eli is kind of on the outside now because he let the, what's his nuts, Mr. Fairy die. <laughs> so she gets cannolis for everyone and makes it look like Eli was the one who purchased them as kind of a, I'm sorry I tried to fuck you to get you to stop nagging me gift. And it works, and everyone seems to like Eli, and we never hear from any of these people again, except for Len, who shows up to just remind us he's there, and he's an ass. I think, um, man, I'm I'm just looking at your volume levels. (laughs) You you are riled. (laughs) Tilted. (laughs) It's such a weird thing where he's like, 
Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I I may have let the the man who funded our entire operation die. That one's on me. Um, I know nothing I can ever do will make it up to you guys, but uh, hopefully these cannolis will help. <laughs> and surprisingly, it works for like 99% of the people. They're like, okay. This is another problem I have that we were going to talk about a little bit is like, the rich people and the poor people, like income inequality is just ridiculous in this um, city. And Patrick Ferry dined to fund the EMTs because his children became EMTs. I just don't buy that so many people love this dude. He's not funding the police force. He's not funding anything else. People don't have clean drinking water. And he lives in... We'll see later. They live in a literal fucking castle. Yes. I don't get why anybody likes this family. Could be me. No, absolutely. I have no fucking clue why they like this family. And we didn't mention this because it's not all that important, but he funded the EMTs as revenge against Casey because she, quote, abandoned him to become an EMT instead of staying by his side in the corporate world. Oh what yeah, that's right. She she said she wanted to make it on her own, and he he made sure she did, she she couldn't do it without him. What an asshole! Got into heaven. Yeah, that's why we know that her ex boyfriend was just really a piece of shit. You know what's funny? He didn't fund the EMTs when Declan wanted to go in. <laughs> well, his favorite's Casey, and I don't think they made any secret about that. There's a scene I'm dying to get to with Deck, where Deck gets in possibly the dumbest one-liner I've ever heard. <laughs> All right, well, let's keep going then. I want I want to hear this. <laughs> so they have a night of EMT, and after that, Casey wants to go visit the employees who were with her father when her father was gunned down. And Eli volunteers to go with her, even though he... His inner monologue is like, I really shouldn't be doing this. I don't know why I'm doing this. But he does. And they go to Psycho Pomps, Inc., which I have to say again is just a dumb name. It doesn't even sound good. Like, no, it. I had to look up that it was a thing. I'm going to I'm not going to lie, because it sounds like something an, like I, I don't want to be that guy, but an indie writer. It sounds like Tidal Pool, okay? It sounds like something an idiot came up with. I knew what a psychopomp was, which is why it's like, why would you... <laughs> this is supposed to be a secret. It's not clear why it's supposed to be a secret, other than the fact that literally everybody would hate them if they knew that this family got rich solely off the death of other people. <laughs> um, but it's supposed to be a secret, and they're just like, we're going to name our gold business that seems to rise and fall in valuability in exact accordance with the number of people who have died recently, uh, psycho pumps Inc. And it'll just be a silly inside joke. That's just for us. <laughs> Meanwhile, like one guy who's doing math is just like, wait a minute. I think they're killing people. I think they're killing people and turning them into gold somehow. <laughs> <laughs> well, Eli didn't figure it out. No, the fairies from Psychopomp Inc. who have magic medallion that goes to a different world are actually fairies to the afterlife. But we've established Eli's kind of slow. Yeah, his sister, uh, his sister definitely got the brains in the family. So we find out when they go to Psychopomps, they own the police force. They run the city from top to bottom. They don't. They don't do a good job at funding it or getting clean water, but. You know, that's it's neither here nor there. And when they get here, they, they meet, uh, I didn't even write, Deborah or something. Someone who is with her father. They ended up taking a wrong turn. The driver got out due to a flat, and then shooting breaks out. And there are cameras all over the city that are linked into a central system. And the video feed on that, uh, of, of the attack, was cut. So it switches perspective to Eli. He swore he would never set foot in a hospital again. He's, he's, he's doing a really bad job. Yeah. <laughs> he's an EMT. He's been in a hospital at least three times this book. Yeah, it's uh, it's dumb. 
That's a really dumb thing to add. Despite the fact that Casey is all rich and stuff, you know, she's not really, uh, she's not a really rich, pompous person. She totally acts like a normal person in that down-to-earth sort of way, tee-hee-hee. Real quick, <laughs> did, did, you get, did you get why he hates hospitals? Yes. Is that not the clumsiest way to foreshadow <laughs> that twist? The, the fact that I'm... he hates hospitals, he's foreshadowing something. I thought they were foreshadowing, because when you hate hospitals, typically you hate hospi- you hate being there because you watched somebody slowly die in a hospital or something. It, that's not why he hates hospitals. It's real dumb. It's real dumb. But yeah, now the the thing with the fairies, it, it's kind of like that that old phrase, uh, you know, money talks, wealth whispers. I don't find it unrealistic that the fairies wouldn't want to flaunt their wealth to the general populace. But for all the not so subtle social commentary that constantly runs through this book, with the the setting being a post apocalyptic global warming fiasco, there's all these points where Eli, uh, you know, ex- explicitly talks to Len about consent, which is one of the few good things he does. And like for them to not do anything with wealth inequality, again, maybe it's in the sequels. I don't know, but consent means you can stare at their naked body as they're bleeding to death. But you don't touch them, mister. Well, no, he probably should have stopped staring and started touching, like, the throat area <laughs> that was open. Well, well, the reason I brought up the entitlement is I think this is the point where Eli just keeps thinking it. Oh, you know, she's uh, she's really not rich and pompous. Oh, she's not like like the other rich people. Oh, she's, she's such a good person, despite being so wealthy. Oh, she never likes someone like me, who is broke as shit. Oh. I like how in your mind, Eli is Jimmy Stewart. <laughs> oh, she, she, she'd never like a slob like me. Oh, God. They even have a thing with Ashlyn where like Ashlyn's this like uh, cold uh, businesswoman. She's the ice queen. Yeah. And it's like, obviously, Ashlyn is the only competent person in the room. It's just obvious. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, and Casey's like, I don't like her. She's such a bitch. And I'm like, yeah, obviously Ashlyn is the only person who knows what they're doing right now. So, like, I'm going to go with her. But Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I knew that. <laughs> so Casey has a few thoughts about who may have killed her father. And one of them is Ashlyn because she's such a cold-hearted bitch. It's like, okay, you're trying really hard to convince me that it's her. So it's, it's she, not. She's so mean to me. She tells me to... Uh, Quit fucking up. <laughs> get a real job and and stop wearing skimpy outfits to funerals. And <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's so true. Yeah, that's all. That's why she's mad at her. Not that EMT isn't a real job. It's it's obviously a job I value very much because I'll probably need one someday. But Casey is definitely like. She likes to hang out at bars. She's a twenty five year old girl. She goes around you know parties and stuff. Like and Ashton's like you know. You belong to the richest family in the world. Maybe act like it sometimes. Like, maybe have a little responsibility. Yeah. We'll get to the funeral. The funeral's one of the best scenes. Oh, it's so great. We're, we're almost at so the, the funeral. Next chapters, yeah. next chapters aren't really too important. Casey gets put in charge of her father's affairs. Who would have seen that coming? And, and it that... was expected it would be Rylan, but whatever. Can I say, okay, so Casey is made the executor of her father's will. And that plot goes absolutely nowhere at first okay let me explain a little behind the scenes to you again uh nate finished this book before i did and so he was telling me about it a little bit and we were talking about like okay how are we going to prep the podcast what are we going to talk about and when you told me like the next couple chapters aren't important and i was still like i was just getting past this point in the book and i was like i don't know it really seems like they're like she's she's gonna get access to all these documents and she's gonna find all this stuff about her dad and it's like it goes nowhere she does nothing as the executor of the will we never see her execute any part of the will it has no bearing on the story that she is the executor of her father's will we never once see her attend to the business of you know making sure her father's final wishes are fulfilled and the distribution of his property It only serves to make Ashlyn look suspicious, I guess. It's a red herring. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, because Ashlyn, I guess, is is kind of pissed that he picked Casey to be the executor of the will because Ashlyn doesn't think Casey's the most responsible person in the world. And she's right. Yeah. But hey, you know what else is in these chapters? 
Even though she doesn't really know this guy, these guys are in tune. He wonders if he should go to the funeral, and he also wonders if Casey likes him or like likes him. Quote, hoping she'll look at him, praying she doesn't, totally confused. Fuck this guy. You... <laughs> <laughs> it makes Fuck you, him. It makes you so mad. It didn't bother me as much as it bothered you. I can tell you that. It is a conceit that they don't know anything about each other and that they're in love at first sight. So guess what the next part is, though? It's the funeral! So excited. Yes! So confused. <laughs> God, I hate him. So... I'm really sad because it's a funeral, but like I'm really happy because my girlfriend might be there. And that's not an issue for me because I'm some kind of psychopath. Len is being chastised by Eli. Well, in Eli's head. Eli doesn't say anything aloud. And Well, hang on, hang on, hang on. Okay, so the funeral <laughs> happens, right? Okay. They go through the funeral. For I, this, is, I, this is a tradition I don't know if everybody has. So they're in a Catholic church. They have the service. They do the mass. And then the way you leave the church is through the exit where all of the family is waiting to receive the people who came to the funeral. So you uh, pay your respects to the deceased, and then you would pay your respects to the family, and then you would go, I guess, to the burial at the cemetery, if that's uh, something you're going to attend. They're now waiting in line to receive the family, which is not... Or the family's waiting in line to receive the guests, which is not something Eli expected. Eli is wearing khakis to a funeral, which is gauche as fuck. And... <laughs> Uh, he's in line behind Len, who is go through. He's like shaking hands, shaking hands, shaking hands, and then Len Len does something less than tactful. Len is looking at Casey like a piece of meat. <gasps> I commented on that. So this is in Eli's inner monologue. He's like, "Oh, Len's looking at her like a piece of meat," and I was just like. God, can you imagine if this guy had an ounce of self-awareness? Len never did look at Casey's naked, bleeding body. Yeah, I was going to say, you know what looks like meat? Butchered corpses. You know what you were attracted to not two hours ago? Anyway, so Len, uh, you're supposed to shake hands at a funeral. You know, keep it classy. Casey sticks out her hand, and Len uh, pulls her into a big old bear hug. And Len is also wearing a suit that's like two sizes too small that he's like nearly busting out of. And Casey's, like, looking really uncomfortable. And that's when uh, we realize there's another gentleman standing behind Eli. And he's just like, <laughs> <laughs> He's breathing fire. He yeah. Like fork. <laughs> he's got horns. <laughs> uh, it's Moros. He's in town. He came to the funeral of his old friend, the Ch the Charon. Oh, God. I we are going to get so many comments about our pronunciation. Moros is there, and he is, uh, he's just enjoying the awkwardness of the whole thing. He, he's, but he's, he's pretty polite to Eli, and he also observes that Len is kind of a creep. Eli can't help but notice that all of the fairy family seem to be, like, terrified of this dude. Except the immediate, Casey's immediate family of her brothers and sisters, who are livid that he's there. But then it's time for, Eli to go through the family line. So, you know, he shakes hands with people. He shakes hands with Deck and he, he apologizes to Deck. He's like, I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry I wasn't able to save your dad. Like, and Deck tells him, you know, he understands you did, you did everything you could. And because Deck obviously knows that his dad was marked, there was nothing Eli could have done. Goes, he goes to shake Casey's hands and, and, uh, Casey just, uh, Casey pulls Eli into an awkward hug now. And she's like, really hugging it out like there is a record scratch you can just hear in the book she's hugging him for so long that the line of people trying to leave the funeral is now backed <laughs> up <laughs> there's something you have in the script and is it an actual quote yes from eli yes, yes. ah any her delicious breasts are pressing into his chest is your window closed now yes <laughs> <laughs> i just picture like your neighbors coming up to you the next morning and you're like i'm doing a podcast <laughs> so so yeah deck and riley angry look yeah deck and riley are giving him angry looks because he's it's super inappropriate <laughs> like he thinks it's because like oh they don't want him dating his sister and it's like yeah not at the funeral guy like <laughs> not, not at my dad's fucking funeral no casey's like uh i think this is the point where she invites him to the bar 
I think so. Yeah, she's like, she's like, hey, you should come to the bar. A lot of a lot of the EMT guys wanted to have like a private like wake, and we're gonna we're gonna get together at this bar. And she's like, you should really come. And he's like, I'll think about it. And I'm like, bro, don't go to that. They've got a few hours before the bar, and uh, I guess we get a brief glimpse of Casey uh, f- going over. This is like what I thought her executor stuff was going to be about, but Casey sees that her father had on his calendar an ominous meeting on the night he died that was labeled only final decision and she's like i wonder what that was about could it possibly have had something to do with moros (gasps) and so casey also invites moros to the bar she wants to have a meeting with him and she wants to figure out if He's the one who sanctioned the unlawful marking of her father, who was probably not fated to die. We can't prove that one way or the other. Moros is really the only person who would know. But maybe Casey can um, trap him into confessing because she's pretty on the... He's he's (laughs) possibly like four millennia old, but she's going to get him. But but she's got the street smarts and the know-how. Yeah. Mm-mm, girl. Oh, boy. <laughs> you know, when you mentioned that thing about Ashlyn, I'm just like, maybe the story should have been about her. She seems on the ball. She would have solved this case, and we would have had a mystery story on our hands instead of this shit. I think uh, you could have done a you could have done a thing where Ashlyn and Deck were also point of view characters. Maybe even Galena could be a point of view character. But neither of those, none of those points of views look at people as if they were giant fuckable pieces of meat. And it kind of clashes with the rest of the story and the rest of the tone. Hey, they could. Ashley might be a secret freak. You don't know. So I guess at this point, it seems like a good time to talk about uh, Eli and the Kier. Not Eli and the Kier. Oh my goodness. I am I am just such a You're I'm, losing it. I am all over the place. I'm so random. Um now at this point we should talk about Moros and the Kier and a little bit of their backstory of how they came to unionize and demand <laughs> fair payment for their services from the keepers of the afterlife. Moros is some kind of well, I mean Moros is the Greek god of impending doom, and his sisters are the fates. And so Moros gets a list of all the mortals who are to die, and he dispenses that list to his Kier. They go out and they mark the mortals, and they come up with a way for them to die, and that keeps the fabric of fate together. But Moros was sick of being a slave to his purpose. And yeah, so he's we'll, like, the fuck? I don't get paid for this? Which was... We'll talk about that. So Moros is like, I think i should get paid because i don't know if you've been to earth recently but the humans have invented nintendo and i can't (laughs) get one so i need some cash and he's like the keepers of the afterlife are like no not gonna do it for some reason i don't know why they didn't want to pay him i times are tough um so (laughs) moros and his here uh they get together and they're like we're going on strike we are not going to ferry any souls to the afterlife until we are paid a reasonable wage. And this is interesting because it's also not explained exactly how Moros and the Kier work. The Kier are compelled to mark their targets. And if they don't mark their targets, it causes them great physical pain. So this must have been a hell of a strike because they just didn't kill anyone and so everybody just lived uh and they were they were jumping off of buildings and not dying and people were really i thought that they killed and then they didn't ferry them to the afterlife and they were just congested with spirits no i think they just didn't kill anyone because oh, okay. that's what they said it founded one of the world's major religions i'm guessing perhaps one of the religions based on somebody who was killed not being dead anyway the 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 cure Finally, the uh, the keepers of the afterlife agree to pay him. Unclear where the keepers of the afterlife get their money. Unclear why Moros needed money. Yeah, yeah. Save a penny for the ferryman. No, it's not unclear. You you described it perfectly. He wanted to buy shit like Nintendo, except the, the ancient Greek version of that. He can teleport into a store, take a Nintendo, and teleport out. 
Yeah, but then he's not buying it legitimately. And that makes him feel bad. He's okay <laughs> with murdering people, but stealing is where he draws the line, damn it. I don't know how to get those little plastic locks off. It's infuriating. <laughs> they have games behind a case now, okay? <laughs> Yeah, I don't really know why he wants money. I, I think she took this concept of a penny for the ferryman and, like, worked backwards Just from there. Went with it. The thing is, they describe this as a war between the Kiri and the Keepers of the Afterlife. It's definitely more of a strike. Yeah, I think I I think it, by the end we realize, like, Moros is, is maybe not as bad as we were led to believe. There, there might be some propaganda out there against Moros, but they get paid now. But because the Keepers just generally don't like Moros, they've decided that uh, they'll pay him, I guess, if they have to. And also unclear why they need to, why they couldn't just uh, get rid of Moros and create a different race that doesn't they, want money. They, they do say later in the book that the Keepers might remove Moros this time because he's on thin ice or whatever. And it's like, why didn't they do that? Why didn't they just go, uh, all right, Moros, you want to be paid? Well, you're dead. Boom. Yep. You're out of existence. You know what and else? And now we've made this guy. You know what else the humans have been coming up with lately? Automation. I'm just going to make a, a robot. robot to do your job. <laughs> Got a robot Grim Reaper here, and uh, he's just great. So, yeah. You go on strike, we built robots to replace your job. Just like real union. Uh, again, this is less... Mm, this, is, this is somewhere in my like nitpicky criticism, but like it's also kind of troubling because this is like the central plot of the story. These stupid coins. So, the Keepers agreed to give Moros uh, payment. But, they wanted an intermediary. They didn't trust Moros to do his job. They wanted somebody to make sure uh, he would do the job. Where well, per- no, they were afraid that if they if they paid him for killing, he would just go around killing everybody to get paid. They still pay him for killing. <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't make sense. I but didn't get that at relies, all. Now he relies on 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 another group of people. They wanted the keepers of the afterlife were like, you know what we need in this politics. Let's why don't get some more people in here? Why don't they just pay them a salary <laughs> this whole because thing how can, you, how can you give them gold coins through a magical portal every year you just do exactly that <laughs> it seems nitpicky but this one actually matters Th- this one's actually important it really matters why the keepers chose to do things this way and not some other way and why they can't change it because the incentives are all wrong i don't know that's how the fairies came to be they took away the 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 cure used to mark the people and ferry them to the afterlife. They used to be just grim reapers, but now they're just reapers, and the fairies actually transport the souls from one place to another. Oh, Moros, by the way, also super sexy. Yeah, and he has a conversation with Casey about how Moros was not the guy who killed her father, and how do you know he wasn't fated to die? You don't know, only I know. They leave with like, you know, he decides he might trust her and she thinks maybe he wasn't the one who killed her father. Casey gets one more bit of information before she goes to the bar. That is from Rylan. And Rylan informs Casey that the police did track down her father's murderer. Oh, yeah. He was neither a fairy nor a cure. He was just a normal human. But they did find him with three afterlife coins in his pocket. They are called afterlife coins. You know what they should have? Dumb. You know what they should (laughs) have been called? Marks. Curie fun token. You know, even even Dave and Buster's just has you swipe a card now. Well, what was this kid gonna fucking do with three gold doubloons? (laughs) Apparently, there's a big market for gold doubloons. I guess there are canal pirates. You could go to them. (laughs) Oh my god, I forgot. We're, there are literal pirates in this story <laughs> about are gold coins. <laughs> <laughs> oh Jesus, I wonder if they've got like out in the out in the Atlantic somewhere there's a there's an island with just a bunch of gold afterlife coins buried on it. So, uh Casey finds Eli at the celebration of life and he 
He asked him about what's it, Berg. Oh, you want to know something about what's it, Berg? Uh, how about that it was once rated one of the best places to live in 2011 behind only Honolulu for 2012 and 2014. How about that, Casey? How about that? So they they do a, a very Irish dance, <clears throat> Casey and Deck do. And Eli's like, oh, I'm, I gotta get some air. And that's when he finds Len and two of his cronies, who we'll call Bulk and Skull. Did you know Pittsburgh oh. was home of the Klondike Bar? I did not. Now I you do. For Klondike Bar. Now you do. I would ferry someone's soul to the afterlife to be paid exclusively <laughs> in Klondike bars. So Eli runs into uh, Len, and Len's like, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna get Casey drunk. I'm gonna bend her over the bar. I guess I'm gonna fuck her in front of all these witnesses. Her, her brother's gonna be passed out drunk. I'm, I'm just a." machine and everyone's gonna know it and eli is like uh eli's just like okay we're gonna fight now so eli oh wait could i time out time out man so did you mention this is also the first time eli's ever had alcohol (laughs) no you're right i'm Um, calling bullshit which by the way pittsburgh home to iron city beer so i don't know how that happened but Yes, uh, Eli has never had alcohol. They don't have alcohol where he comes from. They barely have enough water for everyone. They definitely don't have water to waste brewing drinks. Yeah, it's actually a way to, you know, clean crap yes. water. So Really? They fucked up. Yeah. Um, and did we talk about how spicy Casey is? No, I was going to mention her spicy scent. I was going to say, you've, you've talked about it a few times in passing, but I don't think you've quite driven home just how spicy she is. She's got a spicy scent. It comes up every now and then, that her scent is spicy. Spicy scent. So let's talk about Eli, the super buff badass, and his fight with Len, Bulk, and Skull. So Eli beats the shit out of these three guys, but the damn numbers game catches up to him, and in the end, Len ends up throwing Eli over the canal wall into a poisonous sewage below, And the last thing Eli remembers is making contact with the concrete as he sinks into a poison marsh. So, and at this point, I want to say that the poison marsh is literally the street. It's the canal. The poison marsh is all around them. It's the canal that they've been traveling in this whole time, like when Casey was leaning out the window and yelling at those Mandarin immigrants, and uh, because that happened, I forgot to mention. I, I just call him bullshit on how toxic this water is. I could believe you wouldn't want to drink it, and I could believe you'd need a shower after swimming well, in it. Well, well, how toxic is it, Ben? It is so toxic that you will die within hours of coming into physical contact with it. Yes, not drinking it, but touching it. Yeah. Well, and it does get into his mouth. And like she, like Casey sees him spit some out, and she panics because he's he's basically a dead man. But... Second thing, from Casey's perspective then, Casey and Deck run out of the bar just in time to see Len chuck Eli over the edge. Casey runs up, she breaks Len's nose, she kicks him in the balls, shatters his rib cage. For you saying Casey wasn't a fighting badass, she uh, definitely sucker punches the shit out of this dude. Yeah, she took advantage of a guy who was already beaten up by Eli. Eli okay, Eli loosened him up for her. <laughs> well, it's also, why are these super rich people not financing the cleanup of this toxic as shit water that we all have to live in and around this is going to turn into another scene between casey and eli is casey eli you know previously treated her now it's her turn to save his life and she's gonna break some rules to get him back to the emt station super fast she's gonna use her scope to teleport and but wait says deck Eli will be invisible in the veil, and you won't be able to see him, and you'll lose him forever. Shut up, Deck. You're the Eric Trump of this family. So <laughs> she does that anyway, and she uh, she she fixes she him up and whatever. To... All right, read read what I wrote. She has to get him undressed and admire his erection in order to cure him. Now I'm going to get to my second problem. We're going to put a pin in Eli's erection real quick. If this water is so fucking toxic. That anyone who comes into contact with it will be dead in hours without medical treatment. And most people don't get medical treatment that quick because the hospitals are overcrowded and the super rich family can't be asked to do anything about it. Why then 
like we so we've got deck on attempted murder right like we all just oh sorry len i'm sorry not deck dex dex precious len just attempted to kill eli in front of a crowd full of people and not only that three people tried to beat up eli and then kill him and i knew len would not be suffering any consequences from this because len is the asshole in a book and len len has to have some pictures or something at this point len's out of the story like he should be you know he won't be because he's annoying asshole trope but he literally just tried to commit attempted murder or he he committed attempted murder he tried to commit murder in front of a crowd full of people he's done he should be done but he's not whatever but you know what i think we're gonna leave leave you hanging for for two weeks Wondering if Casey is able to save... Hanging like Eli's erection. Wondering if Casey is able to save Eli (laughs) from the pond scum that he's covered in. I do want to point out, though, that, uh, well, I don't, you know, I want to keep you in suspense. I don't know if she's going to be able to save him. But Steve-O did once swim in a sewage treatment plant for at least 30 seconds, and I... I think Steve-O is still alive. So. Is he? Yeah, I think he is, actually. He's doing pretty good, actually. He got sober. Oh, speaking of spice, do we want to give a preview for our next book? All right. So. (laughs) This is what you get for making me read two crappy books in a row. I am unleashing my secret weapon. And no... Not just because it's going to release just in time to ride the movie's algorithmic success. I am choosing Dune by Frank Herbert is our next book. We are going to read a sci-fi classic. And I'll give you a heads up now. It is a long book. So if you want to get started a little bit early, we're going to be releasing the next episode of Marked in Two Weeks. And um, I think this will either be a two-parter or a three-parter. I'm not sure. But following this, we will be doing Dune. It is longer than our average book, so you may want to get a head start on that. If you've already read it, read it again. There's a new movie coming out. Jason Momoa is Duncan Idaho. Oh, it's going to be amazing. Delicious. Duncan Idaho. Shut up. Shut up. (laughs) America runs on Duncan Idaho. And don't forget, everyone, you can follow us on Twitter at WABpod, and you can check out our blog, blog blog.wordsaboutbooks.ninja, for additional show notes and commentary. Thanks again. See you next time. Who the hell is Moros? I already said who Moros was. Pay attention. Moros is the leader of the Kiri. I said that earlier when talking about Trevor. Oh, that's right, you did. Goddamn right I did. I was looking up Pittsburgh statistics. <laughs> Jackass. <laughs> but hey, Eli has a humongous cock, so... Eh? Eh? Right? Eh... Uh... He is too noble to get a meaningless fuck like that. He wants it to mean something. It can't just be because she's trying to distract him from whatever. And so he just kind of escorts her out. Oh my goodness. I lost you. Oh, wow. I'm not going to make you repeat that. Do you have neighbors? (laughs) (laughs) Hold on. I may have had the window open. Oh my god!